Thank you so much for having me here tonight. I really appreciate you all being here. I'm a big believer of making sure that anything I put in my slides is available to you in real time. So I understand this might be a little hard to read, but there is a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly forward slash chn dash mart 19. So if you have any questions or you want to reference anything that I have in my slides, it's all in there. Or if I completely forgot to put something in there, please let me know. So the name of this chat is Using Data Ethically, the Who, the What, the Why. Before I get into this topic, and I imagine that you all kind of surfaced this a little bit, probably in some of the dialogues you were having with your, with your neighbors, is that this can be a very personal and a very, very touchy subject. So as I go through this chat tonight, this is not meant to be me saying that I have the answer or even a correct answer. This is instead meant to be a chat that inspires you to think about what does data ethics mean to you, what are data ethics in your practice, and what are data ethics in your world? How can we think about them, and how can we move further? And I will be using my own, per my own personal observations to inform this chat. So just keep that in mind as we're kind of going through this. So first things first, hey, my name's Lorena Mesa, and on most corners of the internet, you can find me with a really, really obnoxious social media handle, Lorena Nicole. Yes, that is four O's. I made it while watching soccer. I refuse to change my Twitter handle, but it's perfect. And I also am getting a little bit over allergies, so if I do cough or if I'm talking a little bit muffled, just feel free to raise your hand or make a gesture to me to slow down or speak louder. Cool? Awesome, I appreciate that. So a little bit about me and what in the world do I do? So I actually got started in university uh, actually working on the Obama for America campaigns, both of them, with a background in poli-sci mathematics. And from my time in the Obama for America campaign, I then went on to start a PhD, drop out of a PhD, do a master's in Latin American and Latino studies, then wind up working as an engineer in a social media management company, and then wound up doing a lot of stuff with Python, started the Pi Lady Chicago group. That's been going on for four years put my name forward for the Python Software Foundation Board. Been doing that for three years. Uh, I do some other things as well, like have fun trying to learn the accordion, taekwondo, run a lot of marathons. Yes, I'm a big Star Trek nerd. So all that to say is my journey is kind, of like kind of a wacky one. And when I talk about this topic of data ethics, that's very much meant to be reflected based on who I am and what I've done. Uh, and as a little disclaimer, I do want to do a little plug for Chicago Pie Ladies. We are actually going to be doing a follow-up from a panel we had at actually Microsoft, our host, or uh, the folks who donated our food tonight, um, around human trafficking. We're going to be kind of deciding a data project in, in uh, conjunction with Chicago Bar Association and United Nations Women's Chicago chapter. If you are interested in, in that topic or you would like to maybe kind of brainstorm through that, find me. I'll be here for a little bit after. Otherwise, you can chat to us at Chicago at PyLadies.com or contact me directly. <clears throat> cool. I think that was in there twice. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. So this first question that we all op opened up a little bit with, why in the world should we care about data ethics? Well, there's a few ways that I could answer that question. One might be, let's just think about the sheer volume of data that we're creating. I actually used to use a metric that was from, or a number that I found from 2012, where it, the figure was 2.5 gigabytes of new data generated daily. I then was able to update that with a number I found from a, from a Bloomberg article in March 2018, where we're now at 2.5 quintillion records of new data being created daily. So I could say we should care about data ethics because quite literally the volume is just overwhelming. Another way that I could answer that question is I could say, well, the mechanisms by which we acquire our data are increasingly more and more nuanced and not as obvious to us. So you may think perhaps you are someone who's classically trained in, a, let's say maybe you are a social science researcher. Perhaps you would write a survey and you would find subjects and the subjects would actively participate in that process and answer questions. Well, data processes and data collection processes today are, are now happening in ways that may not, be, may not be as obvious to us. My example might be my Fitbit. So did anyone see that, that graphic where it's, it showed that you could actually locate all of the US military bases based on the Fitbit data that was collected from folks in the US military forces? Right, so we, 
I could say we need to think about data ethics because it's not it's no longer obvious how we are giving consent or if there's even consent and how data is being collected or what that data that's being collected is and what it's being used for. The flip side to that is it's not only that it's the volume and the ways in which we collect data, but it's also the fact that we're collecting data on all kinds of folks, all kinds of people. One way we could think about that is I remember a time when I did not have a cell phone. My, my little niece who's 16 months, she's got a toy that's a cell phone and she's playing and she's pushing all the buttons. I, 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 it's so interesting to me to think about growing up in the era of being plugged online where for me that was something that I actually had to actively opt into. So when we think about data collection too, it's, it's happening to younger players, people who are under 18, these are, this just being an example of a potentially vulnerable population. And then all of that to say that all this data as it amasses, it's creating new products and it's fundamentally changing labor as we know it. So I think you all may have heard a little bit about the discussion around autonomous vehicles and its impact that it may have on the trucking industry. What's really interesting when we start thinking about data ethics and we start thinking about how data allows us to create new products which then fundamentally, fundamentally reshapes how it is that we are humans and we interact with one another that to me is the heart of why data ethics is important. So you could say the question is, what is the future of work? What does it mean to be human? What role does tech have in that? And ultimately, what are the ethics governing all these conversations? So on that side of providing you the why and maybe giving you a little bit of a doom, kind of a doomly outlook on why ethics may be important, let's get a little bit into language of what are data ethics. I imagine some of you may have thought of this, you know, the language of right and wrong, of right and wrong. Perhaps it's like that philosophy class you imagine, it's like, what is the ethically correct thing here? Um, maybe that is ethics, perhaps. Or instead, could we say that data ethics are our rights and responsibilities? Or is it perhaps something else? The, the framework that I like to use is borrowed from this article from Philosophical Trans Transactions I found, which presents us a three-prong approach. The first being the ethics of data, that's how data is generated, recorded and shared, the ethics of algorithms, how artificial intelligence, machine learning and robots interpret data, and the ethics of practice. That is the professional codes and guidelines we have that is covering this space around how data is used and collected. So again, this three-prong approach I think really gets to the heart of this dialogue. So we have ethics of data, ethics of algorithms, and ethics of practice. So on the, on the personal note of why I care about data ethics, let me tell you a little bit of a story. So I already kind of cued, clued you in on this, saying that I started in my life working on the Obama for America campaigns. And I was someone who came into it bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, thinking, you know, we are radically going to change the world. And while there was a lot of really cool stuff we did, one of the things that was very novel about that campaign was its use of technology. I, I like to always say to people, do you all remember like the Obama for fill in the blank? I imagine maybe, possibly. Okay, we have some Chicagoans who are around then. I, I remember, so I worked on the Latino vote team and that was so interesting because, you know, in some states we were Latinos, in some states we're Hispanics, in some states we're Tejanos. So that fill in the blank, that really customized kind of feel, that was all informed by the, by the use of tech and data and was really us doing data science before I even knew what data science was. Um, Ariana Huffington, I think, sums it well when she says, had it not been for the internet, we would not have had Barack Obama as president. Um, were it not for the internet, Barack Ob Obama would not have even been the nominee. So really, the role of technology here was really quite, quite groundbreaking, and that was 2007, 2008. Fast forward you know, 10, 11 years, and now we're so normalized to the use of, of example, social media data everywhere. For example, social media data being used to predict flu outbreaks, social media data being used to predict election results, or even reporting crime. This has become such a quickly normalized thing in our world around us, and now we're starting to see the other shoe drop. So these are just some headlines from the past year, just around focusing a little bit on social media and how social media has become a little bit of a problematic space. For those of you who may not see, some of these headlines talk a little bit about actress Rose McGowan, her commenting on the Me Too movement. 
Some other of the headlines here talk about how does, how does content moderation actually work in social media. Then lastly, talking about whose voice do we censor and why, when an example being how do we understand what may be potentially dangerous when you have someone who's a high influencer talking in social media. To break it down even further, when we look at social media, we have these very interesting kind of uh, we have these very interesting kind of ways that social media has either empowered someone's voice or actually muted their voice. So Rose McGowan was an actress who was talking about her, her experience, talking about issues that were near and dear to her related to Me Too, and when her account was actually blocked and no longer found on Twitter, a lot of people were very upset and people were thinking, is it because this actress is speaking out and talking about me, talking about the issues in Hollywood related to sexual assault and other issues that Me Too brought up. What actually did happen, according to the Twitter safety team, is there was, a, there was potentially personal identifying information that the actress had leaked, which actually violates the, the code of uh, the, uh, the code of use agreement, so that is why her account was temporarily blocked. But as we're, as we're looking at tech around us, and we see some voices being muted and some voices being brought to the forefront, we have to start thinking a little bit more critically about how is this working and why. So if I were to go back to, my, to myself, you know, some 10, 11 years ago and say, hey, Lorena, like, I know you're so, like, I know you're really excited about using YouTube to do town halls and to reach out to your Latino voters. I know you're really excited to have this really customized ability to use data that's coming from social to, to help roll out this get out the vote strategy. But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually ask you to think a little bit more critically about it. So it's interesting, you know, we, you know hindsight's 2020, right? This lesson here and the lesson that I've started to observe particularly around social media data is, you know, should we have maybe stopped to think a little bit more critically about if we use this data, what that means? If we start using this tech and we start radically changing how politics works, what does that mean for the rest of all politicians, all political campaigns to come? Uh, I, I imagine many people in this room have probably read Kathy O'Neill's book. It's like the quintessential pop culture book if you want to terrify yourself about how data can do uh, how data can do damaging things in the world around us. I, I think she speaks very eloquently about this, particularly highlighting this theme here that I was trying to, to point out around the privilege we'll see time and again are processed more by people, the masses by machines. So when we're talking about ethics and kind of the idea of, in social media, be it censorship, for example, is it a machine learning algorithm that's, that's actually censoring the voices of someone who's potentially bringing light to light issues that are relevant to a social dialogue, whereas maybe the voice of someone highly influential is actually being opted out of that algorithm because they are perceived to be important or somehow greater than. These themes come to us time and time again, and that really starts to beg us to this question, what does it mean to be an ethical technologist? So I'm gonna walk you a little bit through some of my moral, my, my moral qualms and conundrums I had in 2018. So I know this is gonna come as no surprise when we start talking about predictive policing in Chicago. We're right at Chi Hack Night where there's been some groups doing some fantastic work on this. So I know many of us know that Mayor Rahm Emanuel, when he started proposing this idea of having predictive policing, that there was very mixed and complicated feelings around that. Of which some of the strategies that were suggested were this idea of using an algorithm that would generate a 1 to 500 score that could potentially be used to indicate a threat level rating that, for example, if a police officer were to pull someone over and you get this number indicating how like, aggressive they were, they could use that piece of data somehow as a black box to be able to say, this is how I'm going to respond to this person. This is just one example of some of the predictive policing things that were popping up when we started talking about predictive policing in Chicago. And we, in this room, probably all know that that's a highly suspect and questionable thing. Add into it that you have, you have in the entire backdrop of this, so it's interesting, so you have October 5th here, uh, 2014 is when we have Laquan McDonald, the, the murder of Laquan McDonald shot 16 times. You have the, the court case against his, his murder on October 5th, 2018. Actually today, the 81 months being upheld, which is the second article here. And then we have in December 2018, this dialogue around not finding conspiracy uh, or, uh, within the Chicago Police Department 
of trying to cover up the, the murder. So all this gives us a snapshot of like what's happening right now in Chicago around policing. We're saying let's use let's use these automated mechanisms to like try to to try to police, but yet we have these very complicated issues. We have a historical legacy of inequities in our city. We have no ability to understand if we were to use a threat score, something like one to 500, to say why is that number what it is. All of this starts bringing up very obvious and very real ethical problems. So this is where I enter into the story. I was already following this very closely. I had, I had done some work with Black Lives Matter, and I'm always very much trying to figure out how I can try to contribute my skills or make sure that I'm helping empower those that, that are leading, leading the cause and leading the fights, um, for example, around like police brutality. Well, this came across my, my, uh, my computer screen in June of last year, and it's an ACLU lawsuit, which was brought against uh, the Chicago Police Department, explicitly naming a few organizations, including such groups as Geo, da, 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 da. Oh, including such groups as Media Sonar, Snap Trends, Digital Stakeout, Meltwater, Babel Street, and more. What this, what this lawsuit went into saying was essentially that the use of social media monitoring and tracking software is unconstitutional. They found in actual, in actual marketing materials case studies saying, hey, please, this is how you can actually use, ha how you can use our software to monitor hashtags like Black Lives Matter. Don't shoot, I'm unarmed, police brutality, it's time for change. Some of the questions the ACLU lawsuit brought up include, are the Chicago police still using this powerful invasive technology? If so, um, if so, why? What's the training look like? Do we have a body in place to monitor their use of this software? What groups and hashtags are, are, they, walk, are they watching? And what data do they have access to? The reason this was so problematic for me, I was working at a company that does social media monitoring and tracking and built on top and was actually partnered with one of the companies that was named in this lawsuit. That's a big deal for me. So I, I, I think this photo, uh, the white might be a little hard to read, I can read it for you, but what in that moment, what I felt, I, I can imagine is perhaps what Mark Zuckerberg felt when called in front of the US Senate Intelligence Committee to say, this happened on your watch, why? So my question to you is, you know, well, rather my observation for you is, we need to remember that we're all liable for the technology, not only that we create, but also the technology that we consume. After all, algorithms and data are shaped and designed by humans. It is not this implicit process. It is something we opt into. We are actively participating in these processes, actively consuming, actively creating, actively overlooking at times. So for me, what ensued, uh, what ensued for me was actually having a dialogue within my organization, trying to understand why there were armed Chicago Police Department officers walking around my building, armed uniformed Chicago Police Department officers in our building, in my actual office building, getting training. Why were we not more publicly alerted that our software was being sold to them? What kind of checks and balances do we have in place to understand what our terms of service are? How do we monitor how people are using our tools? What does it mean for me as a technologist, because I was working on the data science team, what does it mean for me to actually step up and say, not on, my, not on my watch? What ultimately ended up happening, and it wasn't the only reason, um, what ultimately ended up happening for me is I started having to have a dialogue with myself around what are my values? What do I stand for? What do I care about? Something I opted to do when I started actively looking again for my for my next my next role was actually adding in a values place on a value section onto my website explicitly saying these are my core values and that's what I would link when I would start reaching out to organizations so that was kind of my first step my journey actually started leading me to start thinking much more critically about what it was I was doing what it was I was creating and so this leads us to the question of you know what can we all do Ultimately, what I ended up doing was kind of defining my, my core values, doing research to, to figure out what kind of impact I wanted in the world, and actually having those active dialogues with companies. But here's the thing, that's a privilege. Not everyone's able to say, I can leave my job right now. You know, I don't have kids, I don't have any dependents, I, I'm in a relatively safe place to be able to do that. So instead of maybe just saying, I'm just gonna jump, like, I'm just gonna go to a new job, you might have other investments, you might have other things on the line. 
some of the things you can think about comes back to this three-prong approach. Ethics of data, ethics of algorithms, ethics of practice. So on the side of ethics of data, I'm just gonna tell you, you all are here at a space that is open source heavy, is, is empowered by people asking questions and creating solutions to problems. So you're probably already doing that first step, which is really awesome, but also don't just limit yourself to the projects that are here in this room. Some, some really cool things that I've seen out there, there's a project called facets.io, which allows you to do a lot of statistical exploration on your data set to understand biases and variants in it. There's also this really cool project that I like. It's called the nutrition.media.mit.edu project. Um, and it, essentially what it tries to do is to say, given a set of data, could we make a label, like a food product, that allows us to say, here's the things that we always want to understand about our data. And by looking at it, we could say, hey, maybe this has a little bias in, in one way. Or hey, maybe this actually meets what I need, but I'm going to have to supplement it with ABC. There's a lot of open source projects that are doing a lot of visualization. They're trying to help you think about what is the imbalance in your data sets. So you may not be someone who's going out and buying data, but you might need to do that on your, and audit your own data sets. So try to think about how you can bring open source into your own practices. Second, ethics of algorithms. Um, so as much as I, I want to put Facebook, you know, Facebook has been an obvious example of a lot of issues. They're also at the forefront of trying to think about, really, this is a huge scaling problem. At the end of the day, I believe it's something like one billion posts each day are flagged as potentially, um, as potentially problematic. That is a huge scaling problem. And are we just going to say we're going we're to step back from it? You know, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren may be saying these are too big and we need to break them up and regulate them. We have a lot of discussion about this going on. But another thing to think about when we design our algorithms is to remember you might have like the technical chops, but there is a subject area expert that you should probably be chatting with. So for example, like Facebook is actually trying to make this arbitration panel and this independent oversight group to start kind of helping them inform how to do their content moderation policy. Um, there's also this idea of fair, accountable, transparent, ethical algorithms, fate. Um, and it's super, super interesting. So at Berkeley, for example, they've been doing a lot of papers talking about how it is you can learn fair representations. So instead of optimizing for profit, let's say you're writing an algorithm that's going to give a, a, a bank loan, instead of saying we want to optimize the profit that's going to come from that loan, could we instead think about what instead do we want to optimize so that maybe the outcome is we have all, 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 all different pockets of our populations having equal access to credit, or maybe having equal access to a certain kind of credit. There's ways that we can build our algorithms to have different, different ways to optimize, and that's kind of what fair, accountable, transparent, and ethical algorithms get to. So on the side of how we design our algorithms, think about the people who are in the room that are participating in this process. Think about how it is you're actually, what you're optimizing for, and what is, what is the, 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 the end goal there. And try to think about not only just the business value, but also the actual intrinsic human value, right? And then lastly, the ethics of practice. So for me, this is, a, I think, a really interesting way, an interesting place to start. I'm sure many of you may have heard about this whole, let's have a Hippocratic Oath for data science, or just like for technologists in general. Um, there's a lot of groups who are participating in this, from, from the Data for Democracy group to the ACM, who they, were, they do various chats on Twitter talking about ethics in computing. There's a lot of ways you can jump into these conversations because maybe you work in healthcare, so maybe that dialogue is going to be a little bit different than someone who's working in finance. All that to say is there's a lot of groups thinking about an ethical code and trying to develop a framework, so that's one way you can do it. So moving from passive to active. Join the conversation. Take a stance. I encourage you all to try that. Um, additionally, there's some other things you can think about. How about how do we educate our next generation of technologists? I'm using the example of Mozilla because they have a very clear data collection, data collection kind of process. They outline what it means when they collect data and how it is from collection all the way to destruction. Also, they, are, they have these kind of cool projects going on where they have fellows who are, who are able to be embedded within, it, within various organizations for 10 to 12 months. You just have to apply to get one. Talking about how do we make an open, fair, accountable um, era of internet. They're also doing things like trying to think about what's it mean to have responsible computer science curriculum for those technologists who may be now in university. So there's many ways we can bring this conversation into our practices, and I think it's honestly Erica Joy, love her to pieces. I think she perhaps said it best in her, in her 
Strange Loop keynote where essentially she's saying, here's your call to action. If you work at a company that you know is doing something wrong, do something about it. Tear down the negative changes so we can build the world up to make it more equitable. We can change the world. So it may be that you, you go to your organization, you're like, hey, I read about this lawsuit. We should talk about this. Maybe it's like, hey, law of two feet, I'm going to take my, I'm going to take my talent elsewhere because you're not, you're not listening. There is a lot of, there's a lot to be said about the power and potential that happens when we come together and we collectively think. And sometimes it may mean that you need to bring open source into your practice. All that to say is this should be an ongoing dialogue and not something that's fixed and static. So it's your turn. I want you to think about what's the impact you want to make as a technologist. Thank you. So my question is for Lorena. Um, so I know GitHub is involved a lot with uh, open sourcing uh, projects. So now that they have private repositories, is there going to be a switch to uh, mostly private, or are we going to continue to open source their software? I, I, you mean because now everyone has unlimited private repositories? Um, I don't know of any plans for that. Uh, the team I actually work on, which is kind of interesting, so we have the Microsoft acquisition, um, and something that's been really interesting is we just now have a formal data organization, and I sit on the software intelligence systems team, and what, what we're doing there is, is bringing machine learning into GitHub to think about how to do better tooling, how to understand if you have security vulnerabilities, because that's not something I addressed here, right? There's, I think there's a lot of things that go into open source that includes security as well, and I know that's a big priority. But in regards to if that's the direction of the product, I have not heard anything like that. Um, one of the big challenges in raising awareness around um, ethical data practices has been uh, public and uh, public awareness, and also our elected leaders' understanding of the technical systems that we're talking about. Um, what have you found to be effective ways to address those problems of um, what's broadly classified as digital literacy, but I think it goes beyond that. Yeah, it, um, so I was just at South by Southwest last week, and it was interesting because there was this panel on um, basically ending global poverty and blockchain, and the question was, is, is it that you know, technical lit literacy prevents people from using tools like, like blockchain technologies to get microcredit? Um, what, I think what's interesting th about the answer that they responded to is how do you communicate value to someone, right? So how do we communicate the value of why this conversation is important? If we're using words like, um, you know, if we're talking about variants or we're talking about like, uh, you know, mathematics or if we're talking about, you know, deep learning or fair, accountable, transparent, ethical algorithms, I imagine while most people may understand what an algorithm is, I think it's instead better to figure out what that, like, what do, what do the users of that product or of that issue care about? What's the value to them? And how can we meet them halfway to, to communicate that value better? So for me, it is, I guess, still a bit about technical literacy, but I think it's humility. Honestly, it's a, a lot of it is humility. A lot of it is listening. And a lot of it is meeting people where they're at. Um, and the opportunities for us to do that, I know not everyone is comfortable going out there and doing that. But we can point to people. I think podcasts have been really cool. I've been pointing people to like a lot of them as well. Um, but, I, but I really do think it's kind of trying to figure out like how do we communicate the value to someone around specific issues. I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, what do you think, whether or not you think that the like whether the government or um, business entities themselves should be responsible for the ethics surrounding data. So similar to how we have protections against personal health information, we have IRBs established at different research institutions and there are laws in place or at least guidelines in place on how, in, how, those, uh, pati how patient information should be handled and um, kept private. I just want to know kind of what your thoughts are on whether we need more government intervention in creating these sort of laws um, or at least rules that companies should be following in order to maintain the privacy and um, be compliant with any sort of data uh, for anyone using their platform or services. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very hesitant to say we just go, let regulation's going to fix it all. Um, I mean, that's the example of FOSTA, SESTA, right? The piece of re regulation that was brought in to try to, to curb tail the, the problems with technical, um, technical spaces like back pages, creating, creating um, an ability for people to, traf to traffic people 
um, and not being able to persecute it, right? We put a piece of legislation that says you can't do this, those businesses close that down, but it doesn't get to the underlying issue, right? I think regulation is part of it. Um, Hannah Fry, she's a UK mathematician, has a very, um, has a cool book called Hello World. And it's talking about kind of like, what would it mean to have like an FDA for algorithms? Like, could it be that we have some kind of clearinghouse? Maybe the clearinghouse has a independent kind of group of professionals from, you know, various sectors that kind of oversees this. So I think, I think we need to move a little bit towards regulation, but I do think we need to be, at, us as the technologists, need to be at the forefront of overseeing that and not just passing the ball over and saying, oh, regulation is just going to be the answer. Because um, again, that's, that, that again kind of goes back to what's the issue today may not be the issue tomorrow. And I, and I get a little fearful when we have a, a piece of law that's just fixed and we can work around that because then you can just have a loophole, right? So I, so I think that there's opportunities to maybe say, like, if we have a clearinghouse for algorithms, could we appoint, could we have, uh, could we have some kind of elected body or maybe the ACM like helps oversee that. Um, there's definitely opportunities like that and also like a, a clearinghouse for data sets as well. I mean, there, there's probably very obvious ways we could start doing that. So anything that I would think there would need to be a blended approach. I was curious to learn more about what it means to be liable for the tech you consume. <clears throat> so I think what's interesting is we as technologists might create technology that we don't ever understand what the use cases will be, right? So with, with all these new ways that you can, um, I don't want to say abuse, but the, the, the various use cases that perhaps the original person created that they didn't intend, on that note, when, we say, when, I, when I kind of use the language that says we're responsible for consuming technology as well, is that <clears throat> if, we're just, um, if we're just kind of passively participating in things and, and opting into processes and not asking questions and having that kind of critical thinking, that gets problematic. I think we see this kind of with the idea of fake news. And I'll use that very, very loosely. Um, but what the idea there is, you know, how do you how do you actually discern like what is truth versus what is false? What is truthy? What is falsy? Um, there's this interesting group, the News Literacy Project here in Chicago, and they're actually creating curriculum for students to actually learn how to have those critical thinking um, faculties. So as we get more reliant on technology and it automates away those decisions, we're then becoming we're then becoming reliant on it, right? And if we're not able to have some kind of mechanism, be it a framework, be it be it critical thinking, be it whatever, to actually understand the implications of that or actually have a means to, to understand, um, wh understand what happens when we, when we automate away those decisions. I think that's where we need, we need to also look at our own practices in that as well. It's not only about creating, it's also about consuming. Uh, for somebody who is in the commercialization of data business, meaning BI to fill business goals, how do you bring that conversation about data ethics to life for both the folks that procure the data and those who you, as the BI professional, help them consume it? Oh, <laughs> um, I would love to say that everyone cares about this. I mean, I come from that from that from that worldview, obviously. I think if you can if you can turn that into a fiscal number. Again, how do you communicate value, right? If, I, if I'm talking to someone who's a VC or if I'm talking to someone who's like, let's buy that data set. And it's like, well, hey, that data set was collected for something else and we could potentially open ourselves to a lawsuit. And like, by the way, here's like three other law cases like this and like, yeah, boom, you lost that much money and it's not gonna happen. I, I, I know it's not always that clear cut, but again, it's kind of like when you're talking to your end user in that case, what, what's it, what does value mean to them? Um, and trying to communicate it in that language, I think is a way to kind of think about that. Thank you very much, Lorena.